Hey y'all, welcome back to Mountain Murders Offbeat. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. Yes, you are. You say that with such zest and fervor. I will. I, I know that it's true. Like you have a lust for life today. I'm Dylan. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, uh, what's up? I realized that this morning when I woke up and last night before I went to sleep. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, just uh, digging around in the true crime world. What about you? Same. Same? Yeah. Man. I'm glad that you're really high energy right now because I'm feeling kind of low energy. And, you know, it's the weather. You're the, you're the yin to my yang. The weather affects you directly. It Anytime really it's overcast, cloudy, yucky, wet, leaves falling, everything's a mess. Wet. Yeah. Damp. Oh. Ooh, I think damp doesn't get a, the credit it deserves as a word. You don't? Yeah. What about dank? Ooh. Like a dank basement. Oh, God. <laughs> All over my face. Some dank-ass weed. Ooh. It's dank. I think dank doesn't get enough credit. I think that's a great word. What do you have for us? You, you've you been digging around, as you say, in the true crime world. Well, yes, I have um, this evening been looking into more into the Gabby case. Okay. Right? It's the case everyone knows, everyone's interested in, right? It's like Tupac, all eyes on me. It's true. Right. And so I was uh, kind of, um, I found it fascinating that uh, um, almost the social media influence on this case, right? Yes. Because that has played a big part in this case, unlike other true crime cases. Yes. And what's interesting to me is these witnesses, in a sense, that are coming forward now didn't realize they were witnesses at the time when it was happening. Explain yourself. Well, um, uh, Gabby and Brian were uh, tracking their progress of their trip on... Um, they were tracking it or they were tracking it? I'm confused. They were tr they were tracking it. Okay. Yeah. They were documenting it? <laughs> yeah, that's a great word. Okay. On uh, Facebook and... Uh, YouTube. YouTube and Instagram. Instagram. Yes. And so people were getting, you know, the people following her van life and all this stuff were watching them... Literally daily, right? Daily posts, videos, pictures. You know, here's our progress. Here's where we intend to go tomorrow. And so after the fact, it's like people have sifted through this stuff and um, have realized they have potential clues in some of their social media feeds. And not even just their media, their personal media feeds, but other people who maybe were in the same area at the same time, right? Well, you were giving me a very specific example of this. Uh, yes, one couple uploaded a YouTube video, and they were just in the same area. Was it the Grand Tetons or whatever, right? Yes. And so they're just taking some... Or if you're Beavis, it's the <laughs> Grand Tetons. <laughs> <laughs> they were just taking video of, you know, being out in the back country and stuff, and they actually um, passed Gabby's van, or what they thought were Gabby's van later. Um, and the only reason it stuck out to them is they're from Florida as well. And they see another van kind of tucked back in the cut off the side of a dirt road, and it has Florida tags. So they actually contemplated, hey, we'll stop and say, hey, we're from Florida too. But then it appeared that um, the van was um, a, not abandoned, but, you know, closed empty. up. Empty, closed right? up, locked up. And so they didn't bother, and they went on. And it turns out investigators actually discovered her body a 1,000 feet from where this van was in this video. But in the video, what can you possibly see in the distance? Because that's kind of the kicker with a story. Some people, now I did I run across this video on TikTok and um, have since looked up the original video and kind of watched it in different speeds. Some people speculate that you can see a silhouette because there's a big field next to the van in the distance off some hundreds of feet away. Um, possibly digging a hole or punching at something on the ground. Now, that hasn't been verified, but um, it, 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 you do see that silhouette in the, in, in the video if you look closely off to the left when you're watching the video. And uh, some people believe that that's possibly, possibly was Mr. Laundry um, either attacking or trying to dispose of her body. But what is so outrageous with this is... Her body was actually found in that same spot about a hundred, would you say about a thousand feet from that spot, right? Uh, yes. In, in my general um, 
knowledge of measurements. I do fences so I can look at a chunk of land and tell you about how far that was. It wouldn't be outside the realm of possibility where the supposed silhouette is from the van. That's about a thousand feet. I mean, come on. I mean, Big Brother is literally watching. Like, that used to be kind of a, a, a joke that people would make. Of course, after uh, reading George Orwell's 1984, then you totally would get that reference. But literally, Big Brother is watching us now. Not only do we have our government surveillance everywhere and these drones and these satellites, but literally every other person on the planet has a fucking cell phone and every moment is being captured by someone somewhere, it seems. There's yeah. no escaping. No, the likelihood that someone in your immediate area is video, videoing or taping or taking pictures is at an all-time high, right? And not only was there that video in particular, there's other videos and accounts of contacts with the couple that basically investigators have used it to make sort of a timeline. And then, of course, we have the body cam footage from the police who actually did make contact with them because they were are it appears they were arguing well you know there's been a lot of discussion in the true crime community as well as uh you know just among i guess the layperson about this case and why it's received so much attention and it's these specifics that are intriguing to people i mean the fact that they did have this very active social media life they were documenting this hashtag van life, right? Um, and people were watching it. I mean, they were somewhat like, would you call them influencers, I suppose, or super social media stars? I mean, they're, you know, they've, they've got a lot of uh, folks watching. And then you bring in these other elements, like he showed back up with the van. He, you know, these people have seen him acting suspiciously in these various spots. And then you've got this police body cam footage that has now been released. And we've pretty much all seen it. And that's so strange. I mean, we normally don't get that much information or moments before or days before a murder to, to see that kind of thing. So I feel like all of that is why people are focusing, hyper-focusing on this case. And then now, of course, he's on the run. Right. So it's just all the elements of like a, for lack of better words, like a fantastical true crime story, right? It's like a fucking movie. No, the the, the room for speculation, I think, oftentimes drives these uh, stories that rise to the top because, of course, ten, hundreds and thousands of other cases and victims out there, you know, of all walks of life. But uh, it's these compelling elements is what men you call them that make these John Bonet, you know, something happened to her in her home with her family home. Nobody knows what. Prominent family. Prom She's a beauty queen. Yes. I mean, those those are the things that are kind of like, hmm, make you raise an eyebrow because it's just not the ordinary story, if that makes sense. Without saying that, you know, everybody else's murder is ordinary, but it's just these like... Like I have, I mean, just fantastical circumstances that make people watch with awe. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what it is. And it's just these, uh, if a child snatch out of the home with her family home. Holly class. And nobody knows it. That's scary for everyone because we all have children. We all know people who have children. That's just something that could happen to any of us. Right. And I think. Um, like the Jack the Ripper case. I mean, that's what, over 150 years old or more, this case, still captivates people. Because how does a person attack, a serial killer attack and brutally murder women in the streets of a city like London in an area where, you know, Whitechapel, I mean, this was like New York, the city that never sleeps. I mean, this was an area where all hours of the night, folks are up and down the streets, and this is like kind of a rough neighborhood, and you've got people out in the streets drinking and whatever, and like no one sees a thing. Yeah, and he has I mean, it's, it's like that's what's so kind of compelling about that story, right? So it's just these certain elements, I think, that really um, pique our interest. Yeah, and let alone he has time to huh, remove organs and, and you know— perform uh, some kind of a surgery in an alley. Yeah, some kind of strange, like, autopsy or hysterectomy in an alleyway. Yeah. 
Anyway, Dylan, I have a really strange uh, true crime story, and then we're going to get into today's offbeat episode. I have one more detail. Okay, what is that? And this blew my mind. I hadn't heard it anywhere. The Guinness World Record holder for most identifications by forensic artists, a Miss Lois Gibson, has released multiple sketches of what Mr. Laundry would look like if he changed his appearance, such as if he shaved his beard, dyed his hair blonde, is wearing a visor, cap, sunglasses, and things of that nature. A party wig. A party wig. Um, the glasses with the nose and the mustache, right? Like That's a, a popular one. Yeah. yeah. And, That's a uh, great disguise, by the way. I would, <laughs> I would not find someone suspicious at all if they were wearing the Groucho glasses and nose and mask thing. I would try to make friends with them. Yeah. And I had no idea that was a world record. Thank you, Guinness. One more strange true crime story, Dylan. Ooh. That I felt like we need to discuss because it is in our region. Oh, tell me more. There is a former NASCAR driver named John West Townley that was killed in Georgia this past weekend after allegedly attacking his ex-wife and her friend, who happened to be a male, right? So maybe that's why, with a hatchet. Oh my God, it's like OJ with a hatchet. The athens Clark County Police said officers responded to a call around 9 p.m. Saturday. Um, a woman with a gunshot wound to the abdomen in the 200 block of Morton Avenue, which is located in Athens' Five Points area. So at the scene, officers find Laura Townley, who's 30, and a 31-year-old uh, John Townley with a gunshot wound to the chest. So... When they get there, this initial investigation reveals that Mr. Townley, the former NASCAR driver, had come to this location and attacked Zachary Anderson, who was with Ms. Town Mrs. Townley or whatever, with a hatchet. <laughs> My God, what do you do when someone runs up on you with a hatchet? The Townley's divorce had been finalized this week. So it seems to be a very emotional response to this divorce. So at some point during this altercation, Anderson fired several shots from his firearm, which ended up striking both Townleys. Oh, so he gets attacked with a hatchet. He responds by, he's armed. He's armed. He has the right to carry a gun on his side. And uh, he, so he just, which is... A good reason to have a gun at this point, right? Somebody jumps you with a fucking hatchet. and But he hits her her and him, his attacker. Yes, and it wow. appears that her wound was completely accidental. This actually occurred at the Townley residence where Ms. Townley was residing at the time after the divorce. Now, this guy Anderson, he was not injured, and they say he was an acquaintance of Laura Townley's. Now, they are not ruling out that this is a self-defense type of incident. The preliminary report indicates to be that case, but of course, it is still under investigation, and it's very early on in the investigation, and so far, no charges have been filed against Anderson. So, uh, her and her ex were wounded, but no one's dead. No, Mr. Townley, John Townley, is dead. Oh. Okay. Um, Laura Townley is expected to survive her injuries. Um, Townley competed in about a dozen NASCAR national touring races between 2008 and 2016. Um, it's a, just a wild situation. Yeah, it sounds like a bit of a mess, but um, I must say it sounds like uh, Mr. Anderson... Just acted in, you know, in self-defense. I mean, well, yeah, that truly, seems to be truly the case. Truly, that's what it sounds like, and he has every right in that, and I'm glad that he was able to fight off his attacker. It sounds like um, she may have been hit with either a ricochet or an, an unintentional shot of some, you know, something like that. But uh, that's unfortunate, and that's horrible for Miss um, Townley. I guess she hasn't changed her name back yet. And Mr. Anderson. My God, could you imagine? No, and like I said, I mean, I don't know the exact details, but it seems like this hatchet incident was in response to the divorce hearing, the finalization of their uh, divorce, the dissolution of the marriage. 
and this seems to be maybe some sort of like emotional reaction to that to show up with a hatchet and try to attack her. I don't know. It's it's fucked up is what it is. Well, it certainly seems connected. Makes me but... wonder if there was incidences of domestic violence in the past. Well, yeah. And what's odd about it is the hatchet. Right, that's not a ball bat that was in your car. That's not a gun that you're known it's to an carry. Unusual weapon. That is. I mean, not, unless he's a juggalo. <laughs> that's not a a pocket knife you're known to carry. That's nothing normal about a hatchet, unless you just happen to have one close at hand when you decide to, you know, um, act like a big old baby. Let's be honest, and react badly to uh, a divorce, and and likely uh, leads one to believe that she had good cause to divorce him. Exactly. And like I said, it it makes me wonder if there were incidences like this in the past, domestic violence. I mean, clearly he seems to have an explosive temper. What if there's like a history of hatchet attacks? Like, you know, in in, in 05, he he attacked her with a hatchet and unintentionally killed her pet chicken. You know, and there's just like these, all these, you know, family stories of hatchets. And he was known to be obsessed with hatchets. Right. Or maybe he's like Madison Cawthorn. Oh my God! And he, he, and he just like attacks the tree with his hand and doesn't even need a hatchet. He beats the tree up like Jean Claude Van Damme with just his bare hands, right? Yeah, from a seated position. Yeah. Okay. That's not weird. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been known to beat up a tree or two. You know, ones that have crossed me. You know, or you can. You know what? Hmm. You cannot escape the glare of a maple. Okay. You can't. And that's why... Uh, Those oaks are really fucking aggressive. You pointed out, I mean, let alone the trees in the Wizard of Oz with their apples, right? I yeah. mean, they were out of control. These gangs of, like, <clears throat> roving apple trees. Yes, you, you may think they're rooted in one place, but sooner or later, you got to walk past them, right? And, and they're and, just waiting. And you pointed out, when people put faces on the trees, that just takes it to a whole nother level. Oh, because yeah. there's already this presence in that tree, like, you know, I'll drop a big-ass branch on you or whatever. I'll just fall over on your house. You know, fuck you. Here, I'm going to throw a couple nuts at you. <laughs> oh, my God. A little acorn. I hate to get nutted by trees. Right in the eye. Oh, and then that burns. Exactly. Okay. Let's get into today's offbeat, Dylan. We are actually going to give you a bit of a history lesson. This story blows my mind. I mean, I'm no historian, But I do find this to be absolutely wild. We need to talk about it. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, I feel like this is sort of like uh, the American Revolutionary War Liam Neeson or something. Okay. Okay. So I hope that you like American history. Saddle up. Load your musket. Yep. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. Put on your funny hat, pull up your little knee socks, and your put your little knickers on. We're going to spark the revolution. Shine your little buckles on your shoes. Let's get to it. William Cunningham was born in Virginia, 1756. Oh, wow. It's a okay. long time ago. <laughs> so he was right in the thick of it. Now, his family immigrated from Scotland, and in 1766, so when he was 10 years old, the Cunninghams moved to an area called 96 South Carolina, which is near the Saluda River. 96 is in Greenwood County, South Carolina, and I thought this was interesting, Dylan. The name is derived from traders who thought the nearest Cherokee settlement of Kiwi was 96 miles away. Okay. So they called it 96. That's a great explanation. At the time of our story, 96 was a frontier settlement. This area was also known for Whig Tory violence in the earliest rumblings of political discourse among the colonists. The growing tensions among residents was starting to erupt. And now we're not going to get into a full-on history lesson about the beginnings of the American Revolution, what caused it. I think we all probably know that. Yeah, I think we We're all have the a, U.S. We all had the sixth grade history class. We know we have a general idea, but it, it's not going to affect your story, right? Well, we don't need to know. We'll all get that. into a little bit. So William was, as a young man, a lively horseman who had a hair trigger temper. His family was mostly farmers, including his two cousins Patrick and Robert Cunningham, who will be central to our story. People thought William a promising young man who had charisma and seemed to wield influence on others. 
So he was a leader, not a follower. And a lot of people looked up to him. A lot of the other young men in the settlement, you know, kind of looked to William, thought he was smart, believed what he said. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, this would be you if you were born back then. People would have followed you. Straight to the gallows? Straight wherever you took Where them. we would have been burned to be witches, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be the lead witch. She has a third nipple burn her at the stake. Okay. So the Cunningham family were well-known prominent Tories in South Carolina. Tories were loyal to the British crown. They held traditional conservative values. And they upheld the supremacy of social order. So they really, the Tories strongly believed in like social class. Like if you were rich men, landowner. You should have more rights than, like, the poor peasants. Well, it's almost like they, is that manifest destiny to a degree, right? Yeah. I was, You know, I was meant to be rich. They were meant to be poor. Nothing's really supposed to change. Yes. I mean, that's a, you know, yeah, that's a good way to put it. In early 1775, Patrick and Robert Cunningham joined a loyalist militia. 19-year-old William leaned towards the uh, Wick. Wick's beliefs. Um, in June, he joined the Patriots fighting against the Crown and his family. So here he is going against the grain, sort of dispelling his family's beliefs, what he's been taught, and decides he's going to join up with the Whig Party. So basically, back then, in a nutshell, you had the Loyalist and the Tories. And then you had the Whigs and the Patriots. Yes. That was that was the two sides. Yeah, the Tories were loyal to the crown. The Whigs believed in a new America where we govern ourselves. They wanted a revolution. They wanted to break away from England, right? So William became part of South Carolina's 3rd Regiment of Rangers. The Continental Company was led by Captain John Caldwell and Colonel William Thompson. Uh, young William was informed that if the company moved south or kind of out of the area of the 96 settlement, he would be allowed to resign his post at any time. And he really didn't have any desire to, like, leave his home. So basically, if you clear out and uh, move on, then you can resign your post and go on about your business. Yes, and they also promised him, like, a fast track to, you know, being promoted within the ranks, that kind of thing. Hey, we all know the military, the government, they make you a lot of promises they don't keep. (laughs) So on July 12th, the company took Fort Charlotte, where they seized a 1,000 pounds of gunpowder, along with 18 cannons, 15 muskets, and 343 cannonballs. Now, that's a sizable cache, I would assume, back back then. Definitely. I mean, this is some serious artillery for the time. 18 cannons can very well turn the tide of a battle. Yeah. Well, this event signaled South Carolina's entry into the American Revolution. The backcountry was already troubled with divided households. Neighbors with opposing beliefs were growing hostile, and unsettling winds swept the region as talk of war made its way through the colonies. Robert Cunningham was arrested in November of 1775 for refusing to pledge allegiance to the Patriot cause. He was one of the most prominent loyalists in the South and staunchly disagreed with forced support for a new American government. So initially, Robert and Patrick Cunningham weren't like dedicated to the crown. It wasn't like they just were so loyal to the, you know, they they supported the king or whatever. But rather, they opposed what they saw as a pushy uh, provincial congress, which was coercing and strong arming citizens to sign over support for the Patriots. Like they just felt like, don't come over here telling me what to do. Well, uh, well with the crown is over across the ocean. You have their, you know, the people who bring what they say and administer their law here locally. But then when you have someone coming in your yard or literally on your land, trying to tell, you know, dictate what you do, that seems to, you know, that seems to hit home a little quicker. And I think this loyalist versus Patriot, conversation or atmosphere affected like you said literally every household you know you had people who felt you know like the crown's not that bad i'm not i don't have a problem with them but then i don't want this you know bunch of blowhards you know aristocratic kind of you know affluent people here telling me what i should do 
So, yeah, I could see that causing a lot of problems. Well, I think even today, there are a lot of folks who are like, don't tell me what to think. Like, you're not going to strong arm it, arm me into believing something, you know, telling me what I am going to do. You know, that's just a lot of people are not going to be cool with that. And the Cunninghams were not cool with that. When the Whig back militia moved to Charleston, William tries to quit because, again, he had no desire to leave his family. They needed his help on the farm. He didn't want to go to the coast. But instead, he was thrown into jail. Oh, my God. Arrested for mutiny and court-martialed, all at the hands of Captain Caldwell, this man who had promised him, you won't have to go if we leave the area, and we're going to give you a rank. Right? So basically, he not only goes back on his word or upholding his end of the bargain, he's kind of did a 180, you know, a 180 on him. Yes. Like, now you're at the end. I view you like the enemy. Accusing you of mutiny is a pretty big deal. No, absolutely. He is punished by, like, being publicly whipped. And then his name is tarnished. And people begin to, you know, kind of sneer at him, look at him like he's a piece of shit. And, you know, he's free, but it's like, you know, at the sacrifice of his reputation, basically, yeah. and his family name. So people's like, he's a shit bud. Yeah. Oh, okay. William is so angry about his treatment at the hands of Captain Caldwell that he focuses his wrath upon him. So upon his release... From what I understand, William goes to Florida for a brief time, and then when he returns, he ends up participating in this violent campaign against the Cherokee in 1776. Both Patriot and Loyalist militias attack these Cherokee settlements and burn them down. Afterwards, William said he would never again participate in another Whig-led fight, having witnessed the horrific events of this attack. See, it's funny. So you got the Patriots and Loyalists are at odds for you know many different issues. Well, they can they don't they they can find time to come together to attack the poor Indians. Yes, isn't that fucked up? Now, after this, William, you know, he's publicly ostracized once again. After he's like, I'm never going to participate in anything like this again. Basically, fuck y'all. You're okay. You're okay. Fuck you. You're all right. Fuck you. So kind of it was a slaughter, and what he saw done, he didn't want to have any hand in. Yes. So, again, he's publicly ostracized, and he is forced to take cover in this densely forested area, living in the wilderness, as a hunt party is formed to track him down. This hunt posse, if you will, is led by Captain William Ritchie, a man who had served alongside William in Caldwell's company. So again, feeling betrayed by his former fellow Whigs, William's fury only increases. After hiding out for an extended period, William finally makes his way to Savannah, Georgia in 1778. And it's there he receives news that his disabled brother has been murdered by Captain Ritchie. My God. Ritchie has also attacked their bedridden elderly father. So uh, so he gets this news after already feeling betrayed by any, anyone he's really trusted. And, and now he's getting this news that his defenseless family members, basically, are have been attacked or killed by these same people that have betrayed him. Yes. Oh my God. Enraged by this news, William sets out on foot from Savannah and eventually stalks William Ritchie down at his home. As Captain Ritchie tries to flee the scene by hopping over a fence, he is shot dead by William Cunningham. Other stories say that William shoots him dead right at the dinner table in front of his family. So he literally walked his ass down. Yeah. He, he walked there. Like I said, he's fucking Liam Neeson. Like, this man is determined. He feels <laughs> something has been taken from him. He has a particular skill set, and these people are going to pay. <laughs> God. Now, this sets into motion the events that will earn him his legendary nickname, Bloody Bill. Wow. When William returns home, his cousin Patrick offers him a horse named Ringtail. Because, again, he's been doing this shit on foot. He didn't have a horse when he left Savannah, so he's been hoofing it this whole time. Right? These boots are made for walking. 
In retaliation for Captain Ritchie's killing, another patriot named Captain Samuel Moore attacks William's sister-in-law. Well, uh, and from and and so various reports are like he physically attacks or assaults her. Others are like mm, it was more of like he, you know, he brutally raped her kind of thing. Yeah, but she didn't. I mean, that's, that's a cowardly move, and I could see anyone, you know, uh, viewing it like that because she didn't do anything. She didn't kill anyone. She hasn't, you know, spoke against anyone that we know of, and, and she's an innocent. Exactly. Right. So Bloody Bill spends two days tracking more only to cut him down with a sword. So this is basically happening in real time. As soon as he gets news that you've went against another of my family members, now you're on the list. I'm coming to where you're at, and either you're going to kill me or I'm going to kill you. Yes. Wow. Now, by 1780, Charleston is captured by the British, and control is reestablished over the South Carolina colonies. Now, this begins a period of revenge by the Loyalists, who begin murdering their perceived enemies. Outrage spreads throughout the state as clashes erupt between Whigs and Tories. June 14th of 1780, Bloody Bill joins his cousin Patrick's militia. He then leads an attack on Colonel James Williams, who lives in the Little River Settlement. He kills Williams, then proceeds to murder the fallen colonel's um, sons at Hay Station, which is a very brutal battle. So he's like, I'm killing you, and then I'm going to kill you two sons. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. So Bloody Bill then leads an assault on Patriots at a camp, which will later be known as Brandon's Defeat. And this is on June 8th of 1780. Bloody Bill then goes to the Battle of Kings Mountain in North Carolina, where he witnesses the slaughter of a 100 loyalists. He then sees a vigilante execution of nine loyalist prisoners in Oldfield, North Carolina. This only feeds his rage and growing hatred of the Patriots. So, um, I mean, they've created this enemy that, that d didn't have to be. You know, if they just let him be in the first place, they wouldn't have this, um, this guy with a bloodlust after any and every one they can get his hands on. So by July of 1781, the British abandoned their outpost at 96 South Carolina. Loyalist families are taken as refugees and are forced to leave behind their homes in order to find safety. Patrick and Robert Cunningham are among those driven out of the settlement. Bloody Bill takes over the company of 40 men staying behind at the outpost. The Loyalists raid a Patriot settlement where they chase away the Whig militias and kill five men. This causes more retaliation from the Patriots, who proceed to violently plunder the remaining area Loyalists, burning their homes to the ground. The Patriots raise more militias that are ordered to take out enemies of every kind. It sounds like gang violence. It does. Like you kill somebody on my block, my cousin or whatever, we're going to come kill your cousin. And it just never stops. It's like they're trying to one-up each other with the violence. Well, who was it, Gandhi, that said an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind? Eventually. And that's what's happening, bro. Yeah. Well, by September, Governor John Rutledge orders all Loyalist families to be removed entirely from the state of South Carolina. So just clear them out completely, get rid of them. Yes, even though they have homes, they're farming, their whole life is wrapped up in this chunk of land, get them out of here. Right. Well, I guess from his viewpoint, maybe he's thinking that we just can't trust them and that this uh, one-up violence, um, you know, back and forth is never going to stop unless we just remove them from the entire area. Angry, Bloody Bill ascends upon the Little River District where his men kill eight more patriots. He manages to recruit 60 more militiamen to fight for him while marching to Spartanburg. When he arrives in that area, he burns a mill owned by patriots and ambushes others, other businesses, other, you know, wigs, known wigs in the area. So by now, he has a patriot militia trailing him because of these stories of Bloody Bill Cunningham are just haunting the countryside. <laughs> so everybody's talking about it. Yeah. 
He shoots and kills a Whig named James Woods, along with a man named Hillard Thomas, John Snotty, and a Mr. Lawson. He burns down Wofford's Ironworks, a building that is known as a Whig meeting place. He murders Patriots James Knox and Thomas Dunlap at their homes. Bloody Bill then retreats down to the Edisto area, where he is attacked by opposition. Twenty of his men are killed, but Bloody Bill escapes death by going to Charleston. During the, and this is quote called, the Bloody Scout, because Bloody Bill is out doing a Bloody Scout. He is just hunting down these people. Bloody Bill Cunningham murdered 79 people. Damn. Now, he stays in Charleston through 1782, then makes his way down into Florida. His reign of terror and chaos ended in South Carolina, but that was not the end of Bloody Bill. He continued the outlaw life, looting Florida towns. By 1785, he is exiled from Florida for his criminal exploits along the St. Mary's River. Bloody Bill is said to have retired along with his cousin Robert to Nassau in the Bahamas, where he died of natural causes on January 18th of 1787. Oh, that's interesting. He retired to where the pirates would, you know, the pirates out in the oceans would retire to. Exactly. Interesting. So that's really cool to him because he kind of maybe views himself as um, uh, as a pirate. Basically. Bloody Bill Cunningham will forever be known as a man who perpetrated a series of massacres in South Carolina's backcountry. His ruthless, violent raids on rebels and patriot civilians remain one of the most brutal of the American Revolution. Wow. Damn. That's a wild story. It is, right? And, and I think the, um, you know, I think the, uh, the reason his lore and his legend grew is because he would uh, take you take one well, of the first people that crossed him directly and uh, personally and attacked his family members. He literally was like, "I'm going to kill you." Yes, and went and found them and killed them more than in one more in more than one instance. He was like, "My name is Igno Montoya." Yeah, and, and you <laughs> killed my father. Prepare to die. Exactly. Exactly. It was a, it was a blood vengeance that he wasn't going. There's no way he was going to let you live. And the only way to stop him would be to kill him. Right. And then he gets a group of men behind him with a, you know. A and he's already like a natural leader. Yeah. And he doesn't give a damn. And he, it sounds like he's just, you know, full bore ahead. And then he ends up just, you know, call, wreaking havoc all over the place with him and his militia. Well, hey, I mean, we're Americans, right? We, I guess, reap the benefits of being uh, Americans living here. The revolution happened. Hey democracy america fuck yeah right but you have to look at bloody bill's story and kind of understand how this set him off right well uh yeah i mean especially early on i I don't blame the guy you know and i'm sure it probably morphed into something more um you know he would would come across innocent people you know quote unquote as well and, and that they're branded loyalists or even what, what you know, what's really sad about these types of um, atmospheres and scenarios is that people oftentimes no no different than the witch trials or, um, you know, the Spanish Inquisition. They'll take these opportunities to settle personal. Hey, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. Is that Monty Python line or yeah. something? Oh, yeah. Nobody even listens to Monty Python anymore. Fuck you. No, but, uh, you know, they, they, they lie. They say, hey, that person's a loyalist, even if they're not, just to settle some personal grudge they have with them. And a lot of times, and plenty of innocent people got caught up. I'm sure Bloody Bill killed people who would be deemed innocent during his... Uh, reign of Terror. Rampage and Reign of Terror. But, yeah, in the beginning, if they just left him the hell alone and, and stuck by what they said, the deal they struck with him, maybe they could have avoided all this. Maybe. Oh, my God. You know, what I think is so interesting is we all know history repeats itself, right? And we see this trouble brewing between the Whigs and the Tories. And then, of course, we move on to the Civil War. And we had, you know, Union sympathizers. We had Confederates. We had a lot of Union sympathizers here in western north carolina and in the mountains and i think a lot of people just automatically assume all southerners were confederates 
But there were actually a lot of Union sympathizers, especially in Appalachia, because this was not an area that had slaves, plantations. Most people who lived here were just poor dirt farmers trying to feed their families, you know. We talked about that a little bit on the Lewis Redman case many moons ago. Um, Wherever I was going with this, oh yeah. So you see like these neighbors divided, maybe even families divided by these political views, and they erupt into these very violent, often very tragic situations. And I know we don't get too political here on Mountain Murders, but I have to look at this and see that is seemingly what is brewing here in the United States right now. We have so much political discourse and divide between parties, and people are literally like seething, angry, want to punch each other in the face, violence erupting at certain, you know, spaces. And it just makes me wonder, like, are we headed back for something like this again? Well, uh, there's a interesting podcast that that speaks on this uh, very subject. Uh, I believe it was called "It Could Happen Here." Oh yeah, that's a fantastic podcast. And it, it measures the real time, real world metrics and statistics for the very thing that you're describing, and it certain and uh, you know it measures it in like hot, really hot or a cooling off period for different events. And uh, yeah, this most certainly divided brothers, parents. Siblings, sisters, um, communities, families, and uh, there's no doubt about that happened all over the country, right? Yes. I mean, you, you had people sympathetic to the South cause in, in the North. Didn't you guys see that doc or that docu series or whatever? Not docu series, a uh, mini series. Gosh, I can't think today. My brain's shutting down. North and South. Well, of course. Back in the day. Yeah, but uh, let's, uh, you know, but I think today we express these feelings you're describing in different ways. Now we just get on Facebook and bitch at each other. And yell at each other. Yeah. And cuss each other out. I'd be like, I'm going to unfriend you. I know you're my great aunt, but fuck you, bitch. I don't <laughs> like your political beliefs. <laughs> I know you birthed me, but I just don't agree with what you think, Mom. If you vote that way, then fuck you. You can ain't. shove them beliefs up your ass. You can shove that dry ass turkey at Thanksgiving up your ass, too. I ain't coming. Exactly. Right. Okay. So where do we go from here? That was an interesting story. Well, I I thought it was interesting. And do you want to know, Dylan, how I found this story? Because (laughs) I think that it's kind of a a fun story. Okay. So I love to watch those paranormal shows. And you often don't want to watch those with me. And you kind of think they're cheesy. You're saying I scoff at them? You do. But then you sit and watch like 90 Day Fiance and... Right. Hoarders and Wife Swap and like all these terrible shows. That's real shows. But you won't let me watch my paranormal my ghost shows. I will watch them with you. No, just... you just make fun of them the whole time and you're an asshole. So I can't even enjoy them while I'm trying to, to, to check it out. It's true. So anyway, I like this show, The Dead Files, right? And uh, it's on Discovery Plus. So when I'm at the gym, something like that, I'm able to stream it. When you're not around, okay? So I'm on my (laughs) exercise bike, my elliptical. I'm going to enjoy the dead files. And there was a house in South Carolina. These folks were experiencing a lot of paranormal activity in the home. So Amy Allen, the psychic on the show, she's like the medium, goes into the home and she's describing what she's seeing there, whatever. And then, of course, her little research buddy, this ex-cop, he goes and does all the backstory. Well, it turns out that where they lived, that property, um, some of Cunningham's family had lived on that property and been murdered like near near that area. And so some of Bloody Bill's attacks had happened in this area. So they were thinking, OK, well, maybe there's a tie to this house, this property, the surrounding land. And the actions of Bloody Bill. Perhaps. Wow. Uh, And I was like, who is Bloody Bill? So they briefly touched upon his legend and who he was. And I was like, that is fucking fascinating. Because I'm a little bit of a history nerd. I like that stuff. And of course, when it's related to, you know, something kind of creepy and weird like this. So I had to look into Bloody Bill and thought, this is a great offbeat. That was a great story, just like the Lewis Redman story. Uh, Why that's not... um uh, a movie or, you know, been told 20 times, you know, this story of this man. And the same thing with the Mr. Bloody Bill. 
Why this hasn't been turned into a Hollywood, Hollywood epic, I can't tell you. I know. It, it totally should be I'm going to guess, I bet you a million dollars, Mel Gibson's The Patriot was based in part on the exploits of Mr. Bloody Bill. You think so? It's just spot on, is it not? Maybe. I mean, truly, if you think about it. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. But like the reverse or something of that? Well, yeah, but just, I mean, the, the whole element. I'm, I'm sure they came across this or they knew of this while they were developing their movie. Well, I think they probably won't make this Bloody Bill story right because uh, patriots out there burning their, um, their Nikes and whatever are going to be like mad because we can't make uh, like an action hero or like this anti-hero out of a, a damn loyalist. Oh, so, so you're saying the guy who has his Nikes and his Kaepernick jersey on fire at the same time? Yes. Is not going to, um, he's not really going to agree with the way this is put together. No. Okay. No. All right. Not at all. You know what's the funny thing is when people buy something to d- burn it and yeah, record themselves I think that's burning hilarious. it. Hilarious! It's about the dumbest shit you could do. Easy E <laughs> was quoted as saying, "I don't give a fuck what they do with it after they buy it." Yeah, with his uh, the N- <laughs> the NWA yeah, album yeah. exactly. They're like, "Oh, they're burning the album." He's like, "Good, I'm glad they bought it." Well, it's like the same thing with the Dixie Chicks. People burn their CDs, and it's like, "Well, yeah, but you bought the fucking CDs, so you gave them the revenue." Good for you. All right, so here we are on a beautiful Wednesday, right? Middle of the week, and uh, hope everyone's having a great week. Don't you? Heather? Yes. Always. Don't make any enemies. You don't need your own bloody bill coming to get you. It's true. Right? So uh, we'll just go forth with be kind. Okay, so we learned a few lessons today on we this did. offbeat. Uh, avoid people with hatchets, right? Yes. People who attack people with hatchets are dangerous. Because it, just think about someone running at you very pissed off, wielding a hatchet. That would be a hard weapon to stop if you're empty-handed. That's right? really scary. Because no matter what you do, if you like use your arm as a blocking tool, you're taking a hatchet into your forearm. Yes. And the very thought alone gives me cold chills. I'm going to go buy a hatchet now. Uh, if you make promises to people, keep them. Exactly. Right? Or they may bloody build a shit out of you later. That's why you should just be kind. Like, okay. don't be an asshole. Don't go back on your word. Right. And maybe you should think twice about murdering your fiance if you've been documenting your every day and every move on social media. Right. And uh, as much as we bash social media, maybe it does have its positives. Right. Because we are seeing that like, okay, some of these tips that have rolled in have been helpful. And, and And all the information flowed in very quickly. Right. Into the investigation. So yeah, social media does have its uh, its benefits to it's society. Upside, yep. Right on, on occasion. Wow. <laughs> so if you love this offbeat or just want to say hey, hit us up at Mountain Murders Podcast at Gmail dot com. We love to hear from you, and of course, more content over at Patreon dot com slash Mountain Murders Podcast. Hit subscribe, and if you love the show and you're a you know regular listener, leave us a five star review. That helps. And you can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and yeah. Yeah, and you can just call my landline, too. Call my landline. You can call him on his cell phone. (laughs) Oh, all right. That's it, right? I guess, if you want it to be it. Is that it? Do you have something else to talk about? Is that the end? Is the end near? You can talk about my face or my head or nothing? No, I'm not going to make fun of you today. All right. Okay, well, then I guess that's it. (laughs) Say bye, Dylan. Bye, Dylan.